Hello, everyone. Welcome to this new episode of Global Entrepreneur. I'm here today with Stephanie. Um, I met her at the uh, Global Soon Entrepreneur Awards, and she's an awesome uh, girl, you know, really into having people, especially women, to join STEM. Uh, she's also a great communicator. Right now, she's pursuing her PhD. Uh, so, uh, Stephanie, the mic's all yours. Why don't you tell us a little bit about where you're from and your story um, and, and things you're really into? Thank you for the introduction, Pablo. So yeah, so I met Pablo during the GSEA as the other fellows that you're gonna be listening to from too. Yep. Um, but I am a graduate student at Vanderbilt University and I'm pursuing my PhD in science communication. Um, this is kind of like, I've had a weird journey in the sense that I actually started my PhD journey in chemistry before switching to science communication. Um, but what I'm mostly interested in now is more of like, the filmmaking and the production that goes into creating really effective videos for to pretty much be the medium for science communication. Mm -hmm. um, I think everything is going virtually now, especially during this time. Now teachers yeah. are having to switch their lectures into online lectures. So like what's the most effective way we can do that is pretty much what my dissertation is going to be focused on. But how I got into science communication really led to my my like my venture my found like you know my venture my founder's journey hold on so before um, we get there how did you get into science in the first place like when did you decide you wanted to get into science when you were doing college like what led you there sort of yeah yeah so man okay so i think like in high school we're just pretty much taught the four basic sciences of just mm -hmm. like chemistry physics biology um and i forgot what the last one thing that we that like or were taught in um in high school but i guess it's like my senior year i didn't really know what to do i knew i was going to go to community college but i think i kind of just like chat like as you know like um what do you say when you in process of elimination i decided i was just going to stick to chemistry because i kind of i enjoyed that class the most okay. and my dad was kind of being like yeah i think you'll be really good in science so i was like okay why not and so i went to community college first um, because the community college in my home state, which is Orlando, Florida, has like a, a transfer, like a connect, direct connect to a, like a four-year university. So my plan was to go to community college, then go to the University of Central Florida. Um, I ended up taking chemistry in community college and like bombed the class. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, I was yeah. like, I don't know if this is what I wanted to do. Uh -oh. But from visiting my professor's like office hours, who was also like a Latina in STEM, um, I don't know, I grew to like really try <laughs> to pass the class and I kind of like grew to like it more. And also, you know, it's so like weird. Um, so, cause now we're in the middle of a global pandemic and all these pandemic movies are popular now. Yeah. So do you ever, do you, have you watched the movie Contagion? No, I haven't yet. I, that came out when I was, I think, uh, like my first or second year of community college and mm -hmm. seeing that, and I think Kate Winslet is like the, is the scientist in the movie and how That's she like, so cool. she tested the vaccine on herself. And I was like, oh my God, like, this seems awesome. Like, this is, I want to do this kind of stuff. And I think that sure. also like, and also kind of like propelled my interest in science. And so I kind of stuck, I just decided like, yeah, I just decided for chemistry and continue to push on. And then I went transferring to UCF. Um, I thought I was majoring in biochemistry, but I was only majoring in chemistry. And then at my undergraduate institution, I learned about uh, research and then kind of got groomed con to continue on that path. To so so, so let, me, let me go back a little bit. So you just said when you were talking to your professors, you were kind of like uh, saying that you were a Latina in STEM. Uh, mm -hmm. how, uh, how is that? Like what, what's your background and, and sort of like where you're from and what, what influences do you have, like cultural, you know? Yeah, so I was pretty much raised in Florida. I was a year old when my family immigrated over and they immigrated over from Venezuela. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And cool. so my mom is pretty much part Colombian, but she was raised in Venezuela. So she considers herself Venezolana. Okay. And then, um, and then, yeah, from there, my dad has like a company where he kind of like visited Florida a lot. Yeah. And so he like fell in love with, with the, or not Florida, but he fell in love with the U S. And so to just kind of 
leave the political climate of Venezuela, decided to to my, to move over to to U.S. Gotcha. Do you still have family in Venezuela? Do you travel back there? I only traveled there like once when I was like in sixth grade. Okay. And um, that was so funny because it was a culture shock. And all my cousins looked at me like, oh my God, this girl sounds weird. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Um, but my, all of my dad's side of the family is still there. But my mom's side of the family moved with us maybe like a year or two later once we settled into the States. Okay, that's very cool. So do you still speak Spanish regularly with your, with your family or not? Really? No. Uh, <laughs> my dad yeah. and my, pa like my, pa my whole family talks to me in Spanish, but I respond in English. But I, like, I will speak in Spanish if I have to. I just sound like a white girl speaking Spanish. So then that also keeps me from <laughs> okay. wanting to engage. But I need to, I need to do oh it. Oh, my God. Now with like thinking about science communication and like the importance of like translating things to Spanish, I'm thinking about like even making like like paying like a tutor to like practice my Spanish because my husband he's half Puerto Rican but he's pretty much white <laughs> and yeah. so um and I'm so used it's such a bad habit with talking responding to my parents in English that it's like I, there's no way for me to like force myself to speak Spanish especially living in Nashville right now there's like barely gotcha. yeah like, there's no here. Spanish speaking community there uh, oh man, why didn't you tell me this before? I would have grilled you in Spanish during the entire competition. You <laughs> kept it quiet. Like the pressure of the competition. Come on. Like not oh the my time. god, you just kept it for yourself. That's us. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, that's super cool. And would you say you know all of this kind of like cultural differences with you know your parents being from different countries and you going back to Venezuela and seeing different things? Do you think that affected the way you view the world and and sort of why you got into science in the first place? I think so because like fortunately enough like although my parents had to like start like when they uprooted they had to start over so they pretty much had like their own businesses in Venezuela to then having to like clean hotel bathrooms when they moved to the states yeah. but they were able to like slowly but surely like work their ways up into better jobs and and so being like the third child I kind of had like the luxury and like hmm. the privilege of kind of like being like being raised in like a, a middle class um and so it was a total culture shock when I went to Venezuela because like oh man I remember are you like on TikTok or anything like that yes I am okay there is like this one TikTok that I saw that someone made a comment on, on Instagram where like it was like an Asian American went back to her home country in Asia and yeah. it's like that that voiceover like I'm in the ghetto da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> and so I like cracked up because I was literally that was literally like my opinion in when I went to Vene visit Venezuela that I was like oh my god this place was like dirty and whatever yeah. and um and like and then I saw someone made a comment on that on Instagram they're kind of like like a woke traveler type of page and they're like people like young people don't realize like the privilege that we have when we're yeah. like stuck in this bubble to see like what it is when you like go to different countries and what the norms are there. And so, yeah, I think I, I lived a pretty sheltered life and um, didn't really, I like saw that, but I don't pro process that until like now, like seeing that TikTok, I was like, Oh shit. Like, Oh, oh sorry. Oh yeah. No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> I was like, Oh man, like that, like, you know, I didn't recognize that. And so now I'm kind of like re relearning what it means to be, because even as like a, a Latina in the States, like even going to grad school, like that's also a privilege in itself because compared to like my other friends who are like DACA students, like I don't have to deal with that stress because I was like f lucky enough, I got here soon enough that I was able to get my citizenship before yeah. I, you know, so I still, even as like a Hispanic and I minority in STEM, like I still have so many privileges that I have to recognize and kind of unpack. Okay. That's super cool. Yeah. You know, I think part of, you know, seeing other countries and the way they live and just like being able to face poverty, you know, yeah. and, and see other things that maybe, you know, when you live in your own bubble, uh, you don't really get to see that really opens your eyes. And, you know, that probably somehow had an impact on why you were pursuing science, right? Like to, to improve things and to change the world. And uh, so I guess, why don't we talk a little bit more about your, um, you know, you said you got into chemistry and then uh, later on you, you sort of, I think you did your master's, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then 
and then you told me you you switched to to communication why did you decide to switch how did all of that start yeah so i think um it's a, it's a it's like not a really linear story so once i learned about research in undergrad i was in this program called mcnair which prepares minority first generation or low income students to go into graduate school mm -hmm research and graduate school. So from there I learned about grad school. And so I kind of like, like right when I graduated, I took a summer off and then went straight into grad school. Um, I was in a lab that I like joined that I really loved. I was working on nanomaterials, which was so awesome. I got to work on like different imaging techniques to characterize the way, um, like how, like I was looking at the process on how we make new materials. However, I was in a lab, although that I loved the science and I loved the, like the, my lab mates, I wasn't really getting the support and guidance that I needed from the, the, my advisor, my PI. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to switch labs. I'm so I'm still within the chemistry program, but I switched labs to a different, um, and during that transition, I was kind of like feeling very, um, like really low self-esteem, imposter syndrome. I needed like an outlet. And so I'm, I was actually, so I'm obsessed with like media. So I'm always consuming. Um, so I was watching, I watched a lot of science YouTube videos as well. Yeah. <laughs> TikTok probably doesn't really help with that. <laughs> yeah, I know it's so bad. I'm like down a rabbit hole for like five hours. <laughs> um, but I'm obsessed with science YouTube videos. And I remember coming across um, this new YouTuber that I found and she's a computer scientist. And she talked about visiting the YouTube conference and there, there was like a panel about educational, uh, educational YouTube and how there is um, like the, the YouTuber, the content creators, their audiences are predominantly made up of like older males and they're barely reaching females. But that's also because like there's a, there's a small portion of females that actually or women that do um, science communication on YouTube. And even the women science communicators also see an imbalance in the audience that they're reaching. And so they kind of just like, uh, at the end of that conference, they just kind of motivated like, hey, like, you know, there's, there's plenty of space for anyone to be a YouTuber like this. There's like, it may feel like it's saturated, but like, if you want to do it, just go ahead and do it. So I was like, you know what, that seems like a good idea. And yeah. so I like, I never, I never linked science YouTube with like science communication. I thought I was just like a content creator. Mm -hmm. um, and so I ended up wanting, I like decided to come up with like a name. So I came up with future doctors and I was going to commit to it and like try to do some type of like science, like what would be my thing. And I noticed that like even in science YouTube, there's still a lack of representation. And when I got and think and speaking of like being like in a bubble in Florida, there's so many Hispanics, there's so many cultures that kind of like end up there because of Disney. Um, yeah. That when I moved to graduate school at Nashville, Tennessee, I was like, oh, I'm like the only Hispanic in this space that's like <laughs> not working in the kitchen, you know? So yeah. I like, I end up seeing more of the importance of having like representation and diversity, inclusion, and higher education as well as in STEM. In STEM fields, and so I was like, okay, that's my, my that's my niche, and so I I like really fell in love with it as I was switching into a new lab, and I the more that I learned about science communication and like YouTube and the possibility of even making that a career, I started disengaging from my chemistry research, which mm -hmm. led to me failing out of my chemistry PhD program. Okay. Um, and how, so how did you I, feel like how did you absorb that was it hard like did you consider it as like failure at first how did you overcome that or like did you see it as a natural transition as you were doing other things that were more interesting i i saw it as failure because like i had it in my like this is my fourth year of being in grad school at wow. this point like yeah. everyone in their third year has already passed or has already become a phd candidate and because i had to switch new programs and or switch new labs the new lab I was in was still under the umbrella of what I mostly is like inorganic chemistry. So still underneath that umbrella, but it's still a, a completely different research field. And yeah. so I had to like go through this learning curve of like learning this new, like adapting to a new lab environment, uh, learning a new research method, getting used to my new advisor. 
And then I still had to have the pressure of like passing this exam. And there's already like stress to pass this exam because you know the constant the consequences is going to be if I fail, then I'm out of the of, at the program. Like we're allowed to retake it, but still, you know, like it's just like that judgment you get, like that that judgment that you're getting from that you have to present how well you know something in front of a committee of experts, and they're the ones that are going to deem that you're either PhD worthy or not. And so yeah. I feel like I connected it a lot to my self value. But I also wasn't being true to myself. Like I was really miserable in my chemistry PhD right. program. I was like developing anxiety. I was, um, I had a lot of, I'm like self-diagnosing, but like I had a lot of like panic attacks where like it led to me like just breaking down when I came home because I was, I was just like not happy, but yeah. I like was stubborn and I like wanted to finish this program. And I hated the fact that, I felt like it was other people deciding for me that I wasn't capable of earning it. It yeah. instead of it being my own decision. Well, you know, I, I think, I think that's, that's something that really happens to, to a lot of people in college, if not almost yeah. everyone, right. You're just stuck sort of like uh, mid through your, your major or your, you know, your graduate studies or your PhD. And, and, and sometimes you just don't feel like that's the right major for you, but you just don't want to switch because of, you know, that involves many things. So I think it's really brave and really courageous what you did of switching and really pursuing what you wanted to, even after four years, you know, because at the end of the day, no one cares if you have a PhD at 30. What matters is that you're, you're happy with what you're doing. So I feel like, you know, when you told me you, you switched to, to, to a different thing, I thought, you know, that's really cool that, that she actually took the leap and, and, and did this, you know, so congrats on that. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I, I like share my journey on, on Instagram too. I have like a, there's like a nice like PhD community online, but yeah, it's just like, we, like, we don't, I think, yeah, for the fear of like judgment or like the fear of that, you're not like capable enough. We don't really talk about like the, the, the failing or like the, even the possibility of switching, you know, it's always like, yeah. there's just this weird external pressure. I don't know if it's from because if you go to grad school, all the grad student pe students are all like high achieving students, you know, yeah. and, and some, it's hard. You're in a definition. super competitive environment where everyone's doing yeah. that thing and they're doing that and they're good at that. And then kind of like you compare yourself to others, right? Like that's kind of like the natural tendency. Yeah, um, exactly. So, yeah. So, so do you think that perhaps, you know, the, the fact that uh, a lot of people feel trapped is because maybe they didn't choose the, the right major in the first place, I think. I think that might be one of the reasons why, because, you know, when you're pursuing your grad studies, there's just so many options out there, right? Like so many different research fields. And I just feel like there's not a lot of counseling when it comes to choosing what really feels right for you. And there's not really a lot of sort of uh, possibilities to test things out, at least for short periods of time, right? You're, you're, you're fully into one program and then you, you're stuck in that. And then, you know, switching, has huge consequences of, of time and, and the, the effort you've already put in and the competitive level. So uh, how do you see that? Because I haven't done a PhD or grad school yet, but you know, you're more into it than I am. So how do you see that? Yeah, I think, I think that's literally what it is because like, at least for my personal journey of going from like chemistry to grad school, it's either through like someone telling me I should do it or just seeing like a direct connection to what that next career is, you gotcha. know? Yeah. And so I think that's also like, I wish, yeah, in high school, we don't have like a career exploration thing unless you're like in some external club that does do it, or you have parents that are really invested in like what you should be doing and help you ex with that exposure. Yeah. So you're just kind of like, even as a first generation student, like my parents always will be like, well, I want you to like, you should pick a job, like your education is important, like pick a job that will like help you like not have to like struggle through life or whatever. But at the same time, it's like, they don't really know. They, yeah, you know they're what's out like, there. Yeah. yeah they exactly. haven't gone through a exactly. PhD program themselves. So it's hard yeah. to have opinions on that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so I think even, even talking to like some undergraduate students, they even feel that way too. You just kind of like, I, you know, I don't I, like, I don't want to, like assume that everyone feels trapped at the same time you're only limited to what you're exposed to and if you're not exposed to a lot then you're just choosing what yeah. you think you should be doing and yeah. when you don't even know the, exactly the vast types of majors that are out there what what each major includes what what types of fields are, or careers are possible with each of the majors that are out there and so i think 
like I like ex I didn't even know science communication existed until I was a fourth year like a third or a second year graduate student you know like that's still <laughs> so far yeah into that's life. really far into it yeah you know? for sure. and so I think that's what like what I really want to try with like future doctors is to kind of be like that bridge that gap and that's huge. You know, that's super important. Like uh, from a personal experience, what happened was when I decided to move to the U.S. to go to college, I had no clue what I was going to study, like whatsoever, because mm -hmm. I just have so many mm -hmm. like different interests. And um, so what happened was I applied to like six different universities uh, doing six different completely unrelated majors. You know, I chose like, I know, electrical engineering for one and then like biology for another one. You know, I just I said, okay, I'm just going to shoot at random and see what happens. Um, yeah. So then, you know, I, I had already been to Purdue for a summer program. So I decided to go there because it's a really good engineering school, too. Uh, and when I got there, I, I had actually uh, like I thought I was going to do mechanical engineering. But then I, I chose the wrong major and I was in mechanical engineering technology, which is something completely unrelated. Oh, I just oh, I man. just yeah, I just didn't know what the difference was because I just read mechanical engineering technology. And I thought, OK, yeah, that's that's mechanical engineering. Right. Like. What else can it be? Yeah. But apparently, like, engineering is more, like, yeah. theoretical. And, and then, you know, uh, mechanical engineering technology is a lot, like, hands-on and using tools and, you know, like, doing cars and, and just getting your hands dirty. And I, mm. I, didn't, I, I didn't even know what a nut and a bolt were, you know? Like, I, yeah, yeah. I had never done anything with my hands before. So, um, so I was very frustrated because, you know, all of the, 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 the financial investment that my parents had already put in, uh, mm -hmm. and, and me moving to a different country. And I was just so frustrated with the fact that, you know, I, I had chosen the wrong major. And, and then what happened was when I was talking to advisors, they would, they would tell me, well, you know, then what you should do is just uh, do your first semester and take some classes and then try to switch. But obviously the classes that you will take are not from engineering. So then, you know, you would sort of like waste an entire semester. And I was yeah. like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, I'm not just going to waste like six months and a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and then I was like, oh, man, I'm stuck. What am I going to do? And then I just started researching online. And I found that Purdue has this one program called Exploratory Studies. Mm -hmm. So um, I actually switched into Exploratory Studies. And um, what was good about it was that we had sort of like every day we would have classes on like how to find what's right for you and your right major and everything. So we would have, you know, like personality tests and, and several other tools and things that would help us choose the right major. And, you yeah. know, um, a lot of people took it as a joke, like just as an easy class to pass, but I actually put a lot of effort into it because I was like genuinely interested in it. So, um, you know, after a lot of uh, sort of like taking personality tests and stuff, I discovered that, you know, I wanted to be a doctor and I wanted to do biology, but when I had my, you know, personality assessment, uh, I got the results that I was like really outgoing and I just, my personally didn't fit with being at a lab all day. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's how, you know, like it, it sort of like spit out different majors that I could pursue. And, you know, long story short, that's how I ended up in, in aerospace engineering and, and, you know, um, essentially after being in engineering for a while, I realized like, Oh wow, what am I going to do now? Cause like, not only I wasn't good at math or physics whatsoever, yeah. I also like didn't really have an interest in planes or, uh, sort of like other things. I was really interest, interested in space, but not really in being an engineer. I was more interested yeah. in, you know, like building businesses and, and doing other things, but I, I really like technology. And uh, that's how then I decided to sort of like complement my studies with, uh, with uh, economics and, and sort of go on the entrepreneurial business side of technology. Uh, nice. But obviously it's kind of like a, like a discovery path, right? Like the, the fact that I was just, and, and it was so frustrating, you know, through, like it's it's been like you know not only when i got there to school but also like when i was already into my major i was already a junior when i decided to add you know economics into the mix but like and and sort of switch the way i was like learning and doing things but obviously this was really frustrating because like by the time i was already a junior i couldn't drop out right my parents had already put in hundreds of thousands of dollars and i had already been there for a while and you know it was like it was so much pressure um, yeah. that I feel like, you know, having someone who can really, uh, sort of, I guess my advice to people who are going to start college is try to find someone who are graduating in the field you're trying to pursue or talk to a lot of people that can help you, you know, sort of walk through that path, uh, like, and, and not, not, not doing it blindly. You know, I feel like a lot of yeah. people just go for it and, and that's, that, that creates a lot of stress. 
So yeah, sorry. I I took the, yeah. <laughs> no, it's okay. But it's also like, that's what's frustrating about that too, is that like sometimes academia also like pushes back and resists that, you know? So it's yeah. just like, they make it hard for you to want to switch because like even switching within my own, within my own labs, within, within my own program, the, the chair was just like, no, we don't do that. You know, like they, like they would, though they like, it just sucks because it's like, it's about our education and our journey and what we need. So it's like, why are you making it so difficult yeah. <laughs> for me? To like, like, why can't my credits account for this new thing? You yeah. Know? And, and the crazy thing is that I think I read a statistic that at Purdue, like set, like 67% of the people switch majors at least once. So, yeah. and some people switch made like, you know, my co-founder switched his majors like five times. I'm, you yeah. know, like, that's insane. Like how, you know, and just, just a constant waste of time because you had to then like do one semester and then kind of like switch and then take another semester. So I think, I think there should be a lot more flexibility there. Yeah, exactly. Or just like, man, like not, maybe like not going into, I don't know. I think that's why I kind of like the fact that I did community college too, because it's cheaper, mm -hmm. but also there's also that more of like, because you're just getting like a general AA, it's a general study so you can still pick and choose before having to like lock down so gotcha. like even though it took me like five years to get through undergrad but like i was able to take photography classes and and um and just take more like like more what do you call it like i got my core class my core not my core classes but like you know like my englishes and all those the humanity stuff that we have to do yeah. but like that during that stage two that's where I took advantage of like exploring different career options or like, and, and what that looks like. But yeah, again, it's just like, you have to take the initiative to do that. And it's there, you have to look through so much stuff to try to like find information that you need or like yeah. find the right person that won't shut the door on you or, you know, you're like hopscotching to so many different people to try to find just one answer. And so I think it's yeah. just, it's, it's not transparent, it's not linear, and it yep. takes a lot of advocacy, but it, like, I, you know, I wish there's something in place. I'm hoping to make something in place that can like be that, be that gap. Absolutely, and that's sort of like the foundations to entrepreneurship, right? Just hopping around and, and, and not being afraid to switch and try different things. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess it really goes hand in hand with, you know, being frustrated with things and just trying out uh, how exactly. to fix things. But uh, yeah, so, so, all right, so we were, so going back to the conversation, you were, uh, in your PhD program and now you switch and you have new advisors, new lab, new environment, you know, uh, now you had already forgotten about, you know, your decision, like it's done, you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, did you feel happy when you got into this new program? Like how did, you know, how was that transition? How did you feel at first? Like what things did you like about this new PhD program? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think it took me failing and, being forced to make a decision to stay or not to so then once I made the decision to leave like I had a summer off of pretty much before having to start the new program in August so I failed in like April, March April and so the more I was distancing myself from my chemistry program the more I realized how miserable I was <laughs> and like I felt like I felt like like I wasn't I felt a sense of like calmness like even though there I was still kind of like in this uncertainty phase because of like okay I feel now what like I was looking for my new option I was talking to different professors different I talked to the dean of the graduate school and that's where I found out that I can I can switch I can stay at Vanderbilt just switch to a different PhD program and so but again I, I had to take the initiative to talk to people and it was me prying people to find out that this opportunity even existed and so knowing that I had this option, I think was like, okay, this is fine. Like, I'm going to be okay. <laughs> like, I'm going to be able to do what I want to do. And yeah. so I, so yeah, the more I distanced myself, I realized how miserable I was, but I was still nervous because it's like, well, what if I'm still not PhD worthy? Like, what if they're right? Like, what if I'm only just a master's material? So I still have like that little voice in my head, but once I started it and I started getting to know my new advisor and the way that this PhD program is, it's a, it's a general interdisciplinary one. So I had to propose to the dean of the graduate school what my personal PhD will look like. So I had to come up, come up with my own source of funding. I had to come up with my own dissertation project. And I wow. had to come up with um, how like my qual and my thesis will look like, what that structure will be, and like what is the title of like what I'm going to be. Oof, that um, must have been a lot of work. Wow. It was okay because it was only like a two-page thing. Um, but I had a, 
but I, I, the whole summer, while well, I, 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 man, I found so many loopholes loopholes in academia that like worked for my benefit. Yeah. So I was still able to work at a deal that I can still TA chemistry to get paid for the summer. So I wasn't completely unemployed, but I still had, because I wasn't in a part of a lab, I had more freedom to like explore my options. And so I talked to so many faculty members within different departments and in, um, in in Vanderbilt to come up with what my committee would be and, and find like who my main advisor would be. And Luckily, I found the director of the science communication was open to like being my main advisor. And so I, um, he was willing to pay for my tuition, which as a, like, because I already have, okay, so the deal that I worked out. <laughs> oh my God. There you go. Years. Business woman <laughs> negotiating. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> exactly. Literally, is literally what it is. Because I already had four years of being in my chemistry PhD program. I, the way the interdisciplinary program works is that I can still have the hours that I spent in that program count. So I'm wow. just tacking on two more years of this new program to make it interdisciplinary. So I'll be, so my main PhD title will be science communication in chemistry. That's awesome. Yeah. And that's so that's really the good. deal I worked out. So yeah. great so now, deal. You're a great yeah, negotiator. For that's for like, sure. I'm not technically <laughs> starting over. I was able to find yeah. um, a new I do a lot of outreach, and so mm-hmm. the Nanoscience Institute is p- pretty much paying for my stipend to organize their outreach. Um, my new advisor paid for my tuition, and so I had myself settled out. So I That's ended up awesome. bringing a com- uh, my committee is made up of two people that are in the science communication department, someone from our education department, um, someone from. Uh, I still have my old chemistry advisor to be that chemistry portion of mm-hmm. my committee. And then I have someone from the cinema media arts department. And so, yeah, I like worked out the system. <laughs> that's great. No, no, no. But like, really, like, that's what it takes, you know? So yeah, I feel like you should never just listen to your advisors. You should do a lot of research on your own and on like, what are the yeah. loopholes, right? When I was trying to switch to, you know, like and do economics and add it to my major, uh, I was like really concerned because I didn't want to stay for too long in college, right? I, but mm-hmm. you know, I found ways to like reaccommodate my plan of studies, and and sort of like take specific sets of classes that would count towards both majors. So it only took me an extra semester to get two majors in completely unrelated fields. It was just trying to hack the system, you know. And that's really important. You can really, you know, like greatly benefit yourself in college by looking at those options that are out there. It's just a matter of yeah. talking to people and exploring. So exactly. yeah, that's super awesome. And um, so let's talk about your transition from all of this, you know, sort of like odyssey and journey into, uh, into your, your venture. How, how did you get started on that? Yeah, so back, okay, so going back a little bit when I was in the, I was leaving the first lab going into the second lab and that's when I was obsessed with science YouTube. I like really, tw- I end up um, being accepted into a science communication workshop. And that's where I learned that this was a legit field. Um, there was like a name behind what I was doing uh, or what I was interested in. And so I like really toyed with the idea that it's like, if like, I don't want to do bench chemistry anymore. Like I wasn't happy doing that. Like what would be my career? So I was like, if I want to make YouTube my career, I need to learn how to do business. And so I end up doing um, so once I joined my new lab, I, um, instead of doing research, <laughs> I ended up doing, um, on the side, like our extracurricular, I signed up for, uh, an entrepreneurship program that Vanderbilt has. Mm-hmm. And so it was kind of like a two semester program where they introduced to you, like the, the foundation of like, how do you develop a business? Like what, like, how do you, or like just opening up the world of like entrepreneurship, yeah. Uh, what it what it means to have a business? What it, what it even is a business plan? Like I didn't know anything, so I wanted yeah. to I wanted to do this um, with my science communication project, which would have been my YouTube channel. And like, how do I make my YouTube channel into a business? And That's so awesome. learning that That's opened awesome. up the door to like entrepreneurship and like the possibility of having my own business. And the more I dove into it, the more I was like, man, this can actually be real. Like this, yeah. I can actually make this happen. Yeah. And, um, and plus so, the fact that you're absorbing so much like different information, like you were only used to academia and now you were exposed yeah. to entrepreneurship, which is a completely different field. Right. 
Uh, that's exactly. really cool. Yeah. Okay. So, so you were And saying. it's like weird that like science communication is like a, 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 a bridge to that because it's perfect. the way, yeah. yeah, exactly. Because like we have the technical aspect of like your STEM major and then entrepreneurship, you know, you have like your business lingo, but the science communication is all about like, how do I make, how do you communicate the technical aspect of your science and make it uh, and communicate in the way that's going to get you funding yep. or that's going to make your, the public understand what your, your research is. And that's pretty much what your business pitch is, yep. you know, literally. And I, and I guess like that's a way to materialize all this science and, and tech ideas into something feasible. Right. And that's yeah. where I, I felt really interested in what you were doing because, you know, I actually wanted to the econ uh, to understand the business side of technology and, and be the person who bridges that gap. I see that there's not a lot of people doing that. And it's actually one of the most important things, right? And I guess when we were at GSEA, we were talking about this, like communication is really the most important thing you can have, right? I see so many engineers who have no idea how to communicate their ideas, right? Yeah. And maybe they have this crazy algorithms or crazy designs or crazy products, right? But they're just so bad at communicating that it's, it's really um, a, a pity, you know, because I've... Um, so, you know, when, when I was taking, so when I took my first comp class in, in, in college, I was really impressed by how people would just, you know, panic and would like blank out whenever they were trying to talk in front of others. And, um, you know, and, and I just, and they would just memorize text and like, you know, yeah. beside them. And I was like, dude, just speak from your heart. You know, like, it's not that hard. Like, why is everyone so bad at this, right? But we're also not like taught it unless you take like, I know we're all like, at least for our, for our course, sometimes you're forced, forced to take like a speech class, but that's still so early into like your, your college career yeah. that it's not specific to like what your major is and how do you communicate it effectively. And even for like STEM yeah. majors, like the way that we communicate is just by giving step seminars and like really dense uh, PowerPoint presentations about yeah. it. But like how to like, yeah, we're not, we're not giving these, these soft skills, quote unquote, of like, yeah, like what are, what's the proper way to like tell a story with your science or communicate it and relate to people and, and not only to just the technical ex experts, but like how do you communicate this to like your grandma and show and, sh and, t and tell, tell the importance to your grandma of like what you're doing. Yeah, 100%. You know, when I was, so the funny story, you know, when I was, um, after we won our first competition, uh, we had to present in front of like others for like, sort of like at a fireside chat or something like that. Uh, so we sort of like gave our pitch with our, with my co-founder and there was a guy who was doing a PhD in entrepreneurial communication. Uh, and that was really interesting because this guy sat down with us and he said, guys, I think you have a, a really an incredible idea, but the way you're, you communicate is really bad. So you gotta, you gotta yeah. practice that. And uh, that's the first time. So we, we got him into our team and, you know, we had him constantly revise her pitch and her technical documents and whatever submissions for, uh, accelerators and documents and things and our public speaking. And that's where our, our startup got really, really good because we would not only improve our external communication when it came to getting funding. And just like you mentioned, you know, like it's the most important thing, like getting judges and investors on board uh, and other mentors and also uh, internal communication with your team. Right. Uh, so one thing that's really important is the way you communicate with your team internally is what you're going to sort of show out to the world. Uh, once you go out there. So if you have a very disorganized team, that's sort of what you're going to show to the world, right? If you have a very organized structure and you communicate well with your team and your ideas, you solve conflicts through communication and understanding, mm -hmm. that's really going to make your startup uh, succeed, I think. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Like even thinking of just like, um, like Sarah, did you watch Sarah's TED Talk? Yeah. It yeah, was really sure. good, you know, but that That's comes awesome. from like her being able to like, like her, her skill and, and presenting information in like in a, in a strong yet emotional way, you yeah. know? And so it's just like, yeah, not, we're not, we're not all given these tools, but yet we're expected to like, to just like somehow be able to do it or pick it up. And it's just like, no, it takes, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of resources. It takes people like willing to invest in you to like teach you these things and stuff like that too. And 100%. So, yeah. so, so tell me a little bit more about uh, sort of what you've been learning throughout, you know, like being in chemistry and being in communication, what experiences did you get by sort of like merging these two worlds together? So how did that translate to your venture? How did it go with your YouTube channel all the way to going through this path of entrepreneurship? How was walking that path? Yeah, I think um, 
The biggest challenge that I faced when I was in these entrepreneurship program and like talking about like how, you know, there, the question we always have that always gets me is like, how am I going to make money? You know? Yeah. And that's always the biggest hurdle that I face because I, I like, a YouTube channel, like everyone, all like my mentors would be like, well, no one wants to invest in a YouTube channel. You know, it's like, so what is it? Like, how can you expand upon it? How can you reshift? Or like, what can you do? Um, like who's going to be your client? All those things. It's just like answering how I'm going to make money has been the biggest challenge that, that that's what kept me go- diving deeper into entrepreneurship to like, you know, can I make this bigger? Like, can I be bigger than just a YouTube channel? Like what else can I be offering? Yeah. Um, how am I going to make money? Like, who's going to be my client? And so I, uh, preparing for the GSEA really pushed me to like have these questions, but even still, I didn't have it concrete enough. Like now I have a better idea of like what my business is going to be, but I still need to do more. Like, it's just going to come back to like, you know, the re- the reiteration process of just like, okay, like, um, so what future doctors is, I want it to be like a media company and I want to create content. That's mostly what my PhD is. I, I was able, because I loved, because I put so, oh man, I'm going all over the place because I put so much time in science communication when I was in chemistry. And now that I'm doing, and when I pitched my proposal for the new program, I pitched it. So then my research for my PhD will support, be the foundation for my business. So it's all working hand in hand in a sense. And so I'm trying to find the way that if I want to, if I want to be a career resource for either high school students or undergraduate students, like what is the most effective way that we should be packaging this material in a video format to communicate effectively and to, and for the students to receive the information that they need all in one place, instead of having to dive deeply into 25 million different types of web browsers, you know, that's really cool. I, um, so like I have the research aspect of it. I validated, I, I, because I've won pitch competitions, I validated the idea of the importance of having a career exploration tool Mm -hmm. for students. But again, it's like, who's going to pay for this? (laughs) Yeah. Because it's like, you have to have like millions of views on YouTube, which it takes like people 10 years just to generate that type of audience and have that type of revenue. So it's like, that's not really feasible. And so like now I'm in that phase of like after after doing the GSEA nationals, now I'm in the phase of like I'm in that career exploration phase of like finding out who my actual client is. Cause I know who my audience is, I know what my what my mission, I know what my company serves. But now it's just in that phase of like who's gonna pay for me to do this. <laughs> well, you know, but I think it's just gonna take patience. Like it's gonna take yeah. a long time. And also this is a great thing that you're going through. You know, like when you're doing business, you have to be practical, right? Like if you're not going to make money that will keep your business to be sustainable over the long run, then it's not a business. It's just a hobby, right? And I feel like a lot of people just miss, kind of like ignore that part, but it's really important, you know, and as a founder, you always have to, it's a constant struggle to finding those funds and finding those resources to be able to grow your vision. And it's not sort of like that all you care about is money. It's just that it's really important to be able to really grow what you want to do. In our case, we were doing hardware. So it's really hard because you have, you need a lot of capital to build mm-hmm. something. And uh, our product, like each iteration will cost about a thousand dollars to $5,000. So even though we were winning competitions and making like hundreds of thousands, we were still burning cash like crazy because yeah. not only we didn't have the experience to build a product. So that was even, it required more iterations. Also, we were stressing all the time because we were stuck sometimes and we couldn't keep going unless we were able to find money. But, you know, I think, again, patience, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, competitions, creating content all the time, you know, uh, that's sort of how you're going to, you know, the only way to get money is to just go and and try to get it. Like, there's no other way. So, you know, I, I still think that what you're doing is really really great and and you know over over time you're probably going to grow it it's going to be huge it's just you got to keep keep pushing you know yeah i know i think and i think that's a struggle that i faced this year too because my i had like this vision of like oh when i when i graduate i want to graduate and have like my first client already lined up so i had like 
I'm going to be set, but academia always has a different timeline. But, but why did you set that expectation? Like, why are you so harsh on yourself? You're already doing crazy, well, because, amazing things. Well, cause I, cause at the same time, it's just like, well, once I'm done with grad school, then it's like, then what? Like now, like, you know, if I don't like, I, my, my, I, my partner wants to go to school. Like my partner has made the sacrifice, which is getting a little personal, but like my partner has made the sacrifice for me to follow my dream. So now like when I graduate, we had a deal that like he wants to finish school. So I have to be kind of like the breadwinner at the, at that point. So I think I had that pressure of just like, well, man, if I'm successful with my business and I can support the both of us, you know, <laughs> but it's just like wishful thinking. Yeah. That's a realistic expectations. You know, I feel like, like what's the issue with like finding a job and keep grinding on this a side hustle and yeah. then you know being able to do that later don't don't be too tough on yourself you know it's just yeah no for sure yeah i'm trying to find more ways to cheat academia so then i can like ah man <laughs> be a teacher. i can be a teacher you know be like a lecturer professor yeah. so then at the time still have the flexibility of like still doing my business venture on the side sounds perfect you know yeah. sounds like a really cool idea yeah, you know, the, the thing is, you know, another thing I was just thinking about is when, when I was in engineering, my advisors were not engineers. So that was a huge yeah. problem because they would say, oh, yeah, you know, just relax, take aerodynamics, thermodynamics, you know, everything at once. And they just didn't know like the, the like how much workload that would be. And yeah. they, they just they were not, you know, fit to teach people or kind of like mentor people in which classes to take because they never took those classes themselves and I was like mm -hmm. um well you know everyone tells me that this is kind of like a very heavy workload intensive program and this is not what I really want to do and they were like no but you know if you don't take this now then your curriculum is going to get screwed up later uh so you know I, I feel like also having people who know what they're doing and advising others that's that's really fundamental too right yeah so so yeah and then okay so let's talk about uh growth and 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 creating something from scratch so you you had created this YouTube channel, right? Okay. So how what was your strategy to did you tackle other platforms like TikTok where there's massive attention right now? Did you just keep it as a YouTube channel? Uh, did how did you grow your audience? Which platforms you're tackling? How was that? I'm still relatively small, or like I'm still relatively short. I don't know. I I haven't grown a lot in that sense because I like. I had to one teach myself how to video edit and edit videos and stuff like that. And so I only made, I made three videos. Um, I made three videos, but the more I kind of reiterated my business, my business and what it means, I've like, and now that I'm in the science communication, I, I'm pivoting the way that I'm trying to produce these videos. And so I kind of had to take a step back in creating content because now the content that I'm making is part of my dissertation. Mm. And so like I was saying, academia is a little bit slow. So I had the goal of like producing a video like every month, but I, I'm going to, I'm taking a step back and because I'm looking at what's the most effective way I have to test my videos in front of my grad and in front of students to get feedback and reiterate that process to see like, so gotcha. if I one once I'm done with that and finding out what's the best format, what's the best delivery method, what's the best way to storytell, then I'm able to have like a formula that I can stick to and I'm able to produce content faster that way. Interesting. So I'm kind of cool. taking a slower approach at this time, but I'm still growing though. My audiences are kind of different. I, I got that question on a, on a pitch before going to GSEA of like, if I ever thought about expanding into TikTok and stuff. But I think I will. So my plan is part of my dissertation is like once I'm making the videos, I'm going to design a media campaign as well. And so like what um, I'm going to have a series of four videos, um, two of them or two each will uh, follow. Um, uh, this one will be like more of a storytelling method and the other will be more of kind of like a direct interview type of format. Gotcha. Um, and then each one of those <laughs> would, um, would have a media campaign that follows to show like, like how it helps with like the view, the viewing ship. Um, does it direct more people to my website? Does it direct more people? Does it produce more engagement? Cause having that information too also helps with my business plan because that's always a question of like, well, how do you measure success? You yeah. know? 
And so, you know, uh, so that's like pretty much I'm working my, I'm working out my marketing strategy with my dissertation. That's really cool. So the goal is to, um, like not only have my videos, but include some type of short clip that I can either put on IGTV or, uh, through TikTok, um, and have that be those be the sources to either, um, being having like, you know, being like a Patreon member or like pay for a subscription to have access to either um, interviews or like, um, like a Zoom chat, a Zoom conference with like the, the people that I feature in my videos or um, getting some type of coaching, some type of more access to more training, like pretty much getting them to redirect to my website where, which will have more of the resources and more uh, where the, the scientists that I feature will be kind of housed there and have their information on there. So that's what, that's my plan of growth for right now. Okay. And I'm using that as my dissertation. That's awesome. You know, just as a, as a piece of sort of like a comment I have is TikTok right now is crazy because you can post a, vi a video and it just goes viral really fast. Mm -hmm. So I think you should be posting content on TikTok all the time. You know, like, yeah. or at least like those videos. So what I'm doing right now, I just started sort of like working on my social media strategy. And uh, what I do is like, I would just grab some videos from YouTube and like, you know, like have like short clips and put them on TikTok. And what was crazy was like the first video I uploaded, I got like 500 views in like 12 minutes. I was like, yeah. wow, this is insane. Yeah. And I'm still yeah. learning how to use a platform. But what I, you know, like it, when you post a video on YouTube, it takes about, you know, like a month to get like 500 users or yeah, like 500 views uh, after a lot of sort of like publishing it on different social media, but TikTok just goes viral because of the way the algorithm works. So definitely, you know, what I would say is like, look into that further. It's really crazy. Yeah, I had someone come up to me after, cause I asked, I got asked that question during a pitch competition and I had someone come up to me, she's like, don't do TikTok because it's owned by like China and they don't, yeah. you don't know what they're doing. They're not clear of like what they're doing with your information and people, you know, like, you know, and so I was just like, Oh, I got a little skeptical at that too. But yeah, I see like, I, if you can just post a dance video and there's like millions of views of like people watching it. It's crazy. And that's the thing. Like the, what I really find crazy is that platforms evolve. Right. So if you look at LinkedIn, for example, LinkedIn at first was the most boring platform ever. Like yeah. the, the way you communicate, like it was just like connecting with people and it was all job related job search. But then they allowed for a lot of different tools, right? Like, you know, sharing videos, sharing photos, sharing documents, sharing things. And it became a content creation platform. And that was another yeah. thing. One of the sort of like the first, let's say like the fifth post I did on LinkedIn got like 6,000 views in like a day. I was like, what the hell is going on, right? Mm -hmm. It just goes viral and, and, and like there's so much organic outreach that, um, yeah, you know, like LinkedIn's great platform for posting content. I'm literally posting content there every day. Uh, TikTok is insane right now. And yeah, sure, you know, at the present time, it's just all about kids dancing and doing like things on video. but as I think that as this platform evolves, I feel like people are going to start following different content there. And I feel like the way it's going to, the reason why it's going to succeed is because of the way that people communicate in that platform, right? Everything's delivered in short periods of time. And it's kind of like a, like a gallery of things, you know, and, and, and you can just browse through what people are doing and like take their content in like short format. And I feel like that's also a very cool way of, you know, kind of like an opposite to YouTube where you have this sort of conversations that go for hours and that's, su yeah. that, that's suitable for some people, but for others yeah. and for younger audiences, I feel like they are more used to fast consumption, instant gratification, like other uh, methods of delivery. And that's why yeah. I feel like it's just, it's good to post on several platforms because you get the, the feel of like how each one works. Exactly. I know. I, it's just like, Man, it's a lot of work. It's a, it's a lot, lot of work. work. It's a hell it's lot of work. work. Yeah. You know, when I started producing content and sort of like doing these videos and other things, I realized like, wow, like, you know, YouTubers and people who like post content every day, that's a lot of work. It actually takes hours to do this. So, so yeah. Yeah, that's, that's very cool. Um, so let's go back to the feedback you got from competition. So now you knew that you had to adjust your revenue model, right? And, and yeah. you know, and, and, uh, and you have to find ways to, to grow this. What are your next steps in growing future doctors? So I need to go, 
I need to do customer discovery again, but yeah. now I have to, my customers will be, um, like who, like, yeah, now I have to feel, uh, talk to, uh, because we went to startup grind right after there's some connections that I made through YouTube and they have like that startup funding for, you know, uh, people of color. And so I need to like, I, I have to reach out to them. I'm going to reach out to like universities, uh, my own university and the people in the university that like um, that have the power of like recruiting the tools that they use for recruiting um, even like lectures and lectures and professors to see if they will be invested in this um, and then uh, and also like principals or like district school managers and stuff like that that are kind of like in charge of like the funding aspect and just kind of doing customer discovery that way to see if they'll be interested if, if seeing if future doctors aligns with like what some is something they can offer or be a part of the curriculum or their recruiting techniques to either get more people into their programs or just into their school in general. And so that's the next step. I, man, I really want to create so much content, but oh man, I like, yeah, I'm just going to, I'm just going to take it easy and like, just, um, you know, come up with my plan. So then hopefully I can jump on that bandwagon and have a, like a, an effective way of like creating, because I can easily go down like an hour just to like create an Instagram post. That's awesome. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I'm still, I'm still growing my, my Instagram because there's a really big graduate school community, even though it's not the community that I'm reaching, but the way that I've been like the way I've been sharing my story about failing out of my program and switching and stuff like that has really helped a lot of other grad students too. Yeah. And of so, course. One hundred percent. And uh, what was I going to ask? The um, so we were talking about social media. Uh, yeah. So so you you were saying that you had to teach yourself how to learn how to edit videos, right? How did you yeah. teach yourself how to do that? YouTube. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best tool. Oh, um, I have. So I took photography. I've always loved photography. So I loved like I'm not. I'm like familiar with the camera. And you say you took that in community college, right? Yeah, I took darkroom photography. But Ooh. before that, I had like my own camera in high school that I like, you know, I played with and experimented with and stuff like that. And okay. so I already had my, I had photography as my hobby, but I kind of like stopped that once grad school started. So it's nice to kind of repick it up again. But it's like, oh, okay, like I know the basics of like editing a photo, but I don't know how to edit like uh, using like Adobe software and stuff like that. And so I pretty much taught myself how to, um, through YouTube tutorials, uh, how to use like Adobe Premiere, taught myself how to do animations on After Effects. Wow. Um, and, you know, slowly work on like how to clean up my audio and stuff like that. But yeah, I, I pretty much did that all just by like sh looking at tutorials and just following them. Yeah, I guess, you know, that's grossly uh, underrated, like teaching yourself, you know, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, it's just, you know, I, I think I, I keep on stressing this in every single video. Like, you got to find ways to teach yourself new skills, you know. Uh, I use Udemy. That's a great platform. Uh, but you can also use YouTube, Google, LinkedIn also has, like, tools to learn stuff. Um, yeah, definitely. That's really cool. And how did you learn how to do business? Was that through the entrepreneurship program or self-discovery? Yeah. Like, how, how did that go? No, that was strictly the entrepreneurship program. So what's nice about the program is that they pretty, um, we have, is part of like an innovation center. And it's free, and right? And it's free. It's okay. Free. So yes. Yeah, so it's, it's very important to highlight that, you know, it's free. So I know that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm just like, I didn't want to leave academia because like it's granted me so many opportunities, so much access to resources, but in, and, and like having, like having all of these things free because I'm a student. Yeah. <laughs> and so, wow. Yeah. Um, and so during, during the, doing the entrepreneurship program also opened up access to mentors, business mentors. And so these are like people that made like millions of dollars and stuff like that. And, and they're willing to just take some time out of their schedule and meet with you for like half an hour or like they, they really believe in your potential and they'll like invest so much more. It's so like even preparing for the GSEA, I had a, one of the, one of the business mentors pretty much meet with me like almost once a week yeah. leading up to the competition for like four hour sessions just yeah. to like get me prepared to pitch. And so, um, yeah, just like lucky, just lucky to have that access, but it's only because of these mentors and their, their, 
their investment in me is how I've, I, I've dove deeper and I've grown in this aspect of it. 100%. I really like the idea of mentorship, you know, because um, I, I wasn't really used to having a mentor. That's also kind of like a cultural thing back yeah. in, our, in my culture. Like we don't really have mentors like generally, but in the U S it's becoming more common, I guess. And uh, one thing I really loved about GSEA was that we were f in a way forced to have a mentor, right? Because they have, so EO, so entrepreneurs organization has this like huge mentorship platform where you would have to connect with a mentor there and, and, you know, these guys are, the algorithm would match you with someone in your industry, or at least that happened for me. Um, and that was helpful. And I also got another mentor who was the guy who brought GSEA to the Dominican Republic. And mm -hmm. I, I really almost like became friends with him because we, we would, you know, he would, he's a businessman, makes millions of dollars and he would just take time off of his schedule and we would sit down and have conversations for hours, you know, about right. several things. And uh, yeah, I've, I've grown so much because of him, you know, so big shout out to Antonio Angelista. You know, this guy was awesome. I'll see if I can get him in the podcast later. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, you know, mentors are, are really, really, really helpful. Yeah. Um, in all but, aspects of life. <laughs> absolutely. So how is the, um, how are you trying to grow? Are you just working on your own right now? Do you have a team of people you're working with? No. Yeah, I'm just on my own. And I, that's what I think. And that's what I wish I had a team because it's like, you know, I can have some because I can. Yeah, things are just easier when you have someone else to work with. Yeah. And I and especially knowing that I have like some weaknesses in that in some aspects. So I like if I had like a team of like two other people, like one person to help me create the content and one person to help me grow the business, like I think I'll be set. But it's also hard because it's like I can't like so many other grad students in the community love what I'm doing, but because grad school and research is a priority, they're like not going to invest the same amount of time into like future doctors as I will, which I know I'm going to have to do more because I'm the, whatever, the founder and stuff. But still it's like, you want, you want a partner that is, is as excited and, and willing to help you grow as you are. And I think I still haven't found that. And I think that's like, I wish I had a team because <laughs> yeah, I would just make life so much easier. So, so would you be interested in doing written content as well? Or do you just want to kind of like do audio and video? Um, well, what do you mean? Like, for example, would you like to have written content such as like blogs, articles, you know, like, I don't know, maybe in a website sort of like writings or more like academic, uh, like publishings or anything like that. Cause I, I know someone who, uh, does something similar to what you're looking into. Uh, she doesn't do it as a, as a, you know, as a company or a business, but uh, you know, she's also Latina. She works at Forbes and you know, she does a lot of written content. So I think that could be a great resource for you. If you want, I yeah. can get you in contact. Okay, nice. Yeah. Cause I know like, I the only written, some of the stuff that I've written on my, on my website was just kind of like, I know I'm all over the place because I feel like, um, like my online Instagram perform uh, personnel is like different than like what I'm trying to do with the business. And so like, cause I posted blogs on like how to switch, how to switch out of labs, like how to find mentorships and stuff like that on my, on my website. But now it's just like, okay, what else can I offer if I'm trying to be more of like a career service? So I don't know how that looks like, but I like, yeah, I just want it to be a multimedia type of thing. So I'm open. I'm open to. to awesome. Form. Yeah. I feel like written format works too. Right. Especially when you're like researching school stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. So um, I guess just to wrap it up, uh, what would be three tips you would give to uh, young people wanting to go to college and, and find your interests and perhaps becoming entrepreneurs? And then what would be your three tips to becoming a better communicator? Ooh, okay. Um, I guess to get into college, um, man, that's so hard. I think find... I think you said something earlier that was, that was good. It's just kind of like finding someone that like majored in what you majored in. I wonder if there's a program. I don't know if there is, but I wish like, just be open to trying new things because you won't know what's out there unless you like, you kind of have to do like the soul searching and, 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 and try something new. Um, also take advantage of any like uh, shadowing or volunteering types of services, like Absolutely. within you know, because I think that's also like, and not like, even if you're like a lot of people that go into like pre-med, 
Like mm-hmm. sometimes think that they're pre-med until they shadow and they're like, oh, this is not for me. Or even yeah. going into like, research, like just within your own professors, like just kind of taking those chances to, to, to be open and try something new so that you can figure out what it is without. Um, and then I don't know what a third, I don't know what a third tip will be, but self-advocate, like never take no for an answer. <laughs> and so if something doesn't feel right in your gut, it's probably because it isn't the right fit for you. Yeah. And so just like, listen to that and don't, and don't, don't, don't be stubborn just because you feel like you're stuck, even though there's some limiting factors, but there's got a way to cheat the system to, to, to work in your behalf. And because it's your education and it's your life, like you have the right to do what you need to do. Um, for communication, uh, there's always like the, everyone uses the same like abbreviation, like the keep it simple, stupid. But I think if you were to, um, if you have, like, if there's, if I'm going to talk in a, in a sense of like in a technical aspect. So if you have something that's very technical that no one has heard about it, if there's a, there's got to be a way to either replace it with the word that's more common knowledge, or if there's no way around using this technical term, then just make sure you explain it, <laughs> explain wow. what it means instead of just like glancing over it. Yeah. Um, the second communication tip is know your audience the way that you're going to communicate to a student is going to be different than someone that's going to be a little bit more educated or vice versa. And so just make sure you know who you're talking to. And then the third one is um, have compassion, have empathy, because if you, the way you communicate is by relating to somebody, either through sharing your personal story or just listening to who your audience is and how they're responding and what, like what their values are, because if you go into a space that you're not really, um, that, um, if you go into a space where if, okay, so I'm talking as like a white person going into a space of like a minority person, like if you're just going to go in there and spit out facts, or even if you're trying to talk to like anti-vaxxers or something like that, like there's a reason why they have their beliefs. And so you just have to be able to like, put your ego aside and sometimes put the, you know, and wait to tell facts and to like learn about them and listen and have compassion for why they're feeling that way. Cause that's going to better help you tailor the way that you're going to empathize, empath- empathize with them and also um, know which direction to approach them at if you actually understand and, and have that compassion with them. Absolutely. Those are great tips. I love them. Yeah. 100%. So Stephanie, thank you very much for, for today's episode. Um, so everyone uh, watching this podcast, so please follow Stephanie's you know, links and, and social media platforms. Uh, I'll post the links uh, in the description section of the video. And uh, you know, if you have any questions for either Stephanie or me, uh, please you know, just write a comment and, and, and you know, we'll, we'll answer your questions. So, <laughs> thank you, Pablo, for this opportunity. Yeah, please, thanks so much. That's awesome. So yeah. Thanks for everything and and we'll talk later. Bye. Bye.